Welcome to this RTPI webinar presented in association with Planning Aid England, which of course is part of the Institute. Please ensure your mic is muted. Today we have four esteemed speakers. Three are highly experienced planning practitioners, plus we have a leading academic in the field of neighbourhood planning. I am Julian Jackson. I've spent most of my, my career working for local planning authorities preparing local plans. Since 2012, I've been a freelance planner and a planning aid volunteer in Northwest England. My day job involves advising councils and neighbour plan groups. And my um, work involves also um, working with a neighbourhood forum. I'm currently assisting one um, and typically such forums have little prior experience of the planning system so often find it harder than town and parish councils to produce a plan. Today we're aiming to reveal the main reasons why some groups struggle with neighbourhood planning and um, that is obviously the, um, the topic um, today. For the last three years, planning aid volunteers in the Northwest have been tracking the preparation of plans in the region. Nearly 200 such plans have been started, and only about a third of them have been completed. Another 60 or so that was started at least four years ago have still not reached the statutory stage beyond designation. I venture to suggest that this, this situation is replicated around the country. So why is this? Before I turn to the presenters, let me explain how this webinar will be run. We have about an hour in total. Each speaker will present their views in turn. The first speaker will refer to a few slides, the others will not. So it is suggested that you make notes. After all the presenters have spoken, a selection of questions submitted by you, the delegates, will be put um, to the speakers for their response. But first, let me outline who is going to cover what. Gavin Parker kicks us off with an overview of the latest research into neighbourhood planning. Nigel McGurk explores whether part of the problem is neighbourhood plan groups are trying to produce a plan for the wrong reasons or start off with false expectations. Eddie Taylor asks whether the whole process is just too hard for non-planners that typically make up neighbourhood plan steering groups. And Tom Evans outlines the problems associated with maintaining community volunteer commitment over a sustained period. So first of all, we have Gavin Parker. Please unmute yourself, Gavin. Gavin is a professor at Reading University and an RTPI fellow. He is an award-winning author of five books and numerous academic articles and reports. Many of these have covered various aspects of neighborhood planning. So if your mic is on, please start, Gavin. Thank you. Okay, Gillian, thanks very much indeed, and welcome everybody to the, the webinar. I'll try to be brief. I've only got a short amount of time. And as Julian explained, um, my role initially, at least, is just to whip you through some of the key headlines and research findings that myself and the team at Reading have, um, have been uncovering recently as part of research that we have been doing for government. The 
report itself um, is due to be published imminently and I'm rather hoping that you can feast on that in more detail um, when that um, when that does actually uh, come out. The, uh, the research we did had a wide brief and I think that um, you know there are a number of different issues here. We know we're, we're sitting in the context of um, what could shape up to be some quite fundamental planning reforms so clearly changes afoot and uh, neighborhood planning um, is likely to be uh, one of the aspects of the system which um, some very um, careful um, engineering will be applied and maybe that'll be something that comes up a bit later if I could have the second slide everybody I just wanted to use a bit of shock tactics on everyone if we were thinking that neighborhood planning was okay i'm not saying that any of you are are arguing that nothing should change in neighborhood planning but clearly this initial bit of shock value that i provided should give us food for thought and help to um presage our discussion what that graph simply shows are the number of neighborhood area designations that um that have been accepted over time and you can see the significant drop off in the number of neighborhood planning starts um, in, in recent years. So um, we might say that the patient is sick, but um, we don't know quite necessarily what the ailments are, or maybe we do, um, and maybe there's a multiple, um, a multiple set of, of, of problems. So what I'm gonna do if I go to the third slide is just show you, I'm gonna cut to the quick, I'm not, really supposed to be giving a lot of detail of the research until it's published but if we go to the third slide what i've done is i've i've kind of taken a short circuit all the way through to the areas <clears throat> where we have suggested to government change in the current system under the current set of arrangements would need to be considered now I've only got a few minutes left, so you can tell that I'm not going to have time to go through absolutely everything. But I think that one of the um, themes and one of the almost continuous themes that's emerged from research looking at neighborhood planning over time has been the, um, has been the burdens question, the burdens on um, volunteers in particular but also some of the burdens placed on local authorities in the context of austerity. And um, what this has led to is quite an uneven take up across the country and a rather skewed take up in more affluent areas. So um, that led us into thinking about um, how funding arrangements um, could be um, addressed and we have uh, made a series of arguments about how funding both for local authorities, but also a more effective targeting of funding for neighborhoods should, um, should be considered. And indeed, one of the first tangible outcomes of the research uh, prompted the recent um, announcement of just a little few weeks back, um, announcing that enhanced funding for deprived neighborhoods would be an urban neighborhoods forums basically um, would be offered so um, we're rather hopeful that some of the arguments about um, following need and, and following the issues and, and trying to um, look at where added value can be uh, provided um, will will have some some traction if i was to kind of randomly pick out a few other things in here um, Issues around design loom large. Given in the white paper, um, it seems um, that one of the options that government is looking at is potentially um, harnessing the power of neighbourhoods in, in in focusing in on design. And before the white paper came out, we we effectively said that this is an area that communities um, actually want to be involved in um, and have been involved involved in quite effectively and we, um, we we're kind of discussing that um, in terms of um, enabling um, that to to continue so that might be something that gets discussed um, also in terms of the relationship with local plans clearly what's happened is that um, 
a lot quite a number of plans have been delayed or have been sidetracked or even in some circumstances groups have given up on their neighborhood plan because of the uh, timing and the sequencing in relation to um, a local plan so we've we 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 put in some comments about um, the sequencing there either neighborhood planning acting to inform and enrich neighborhood planning early stage or indeed coming in and being responsive to and adding um, detail and um, helping um, planning at, at scale to be more sophisticated and tailored to very local need so you can see through that whole list that the the research you can imply did look at a whole range of different considerations and questions in neighborhood planning and um, I'm not quite sure how many minutes I've got left but if I if I chance my arm um, we also wanted to look at and we've talked about um, neighborhood planning post plan production and that's very much the whole issue around how one can um, enhance the prospects of neighborhood plan policies being taken into account in decision making and into implementation and so and so there are some some comments about how um, how that should be enabled including potentially looking at providing um, further continuation support for neighborhood planning groups perhaps specifically for forums that otherwise don't have um, a framework to inhabit um, long term so um, quite a lot of things there um, some things I could pick up in questions later on um, but I think I'd better stop now and use what I've said so far to act as the kind of the, the vanguard before we you know get into some of the specific topic areas that Julian introduced so thanks very much that's where I'll stop thank you very much uh, Gavin um, clearly there are some uh, interesting areas there that have been researched and we look forward to uh, to seeing that uh, that research published soon um, next we have um, Nigel McGurk um, please unmute yourself Nigel Nigel is involved in a wide range of planning and housing roles he was a founding member of NPEERS and has become one of the most experienced neighborhood plan examiners so if your mic is on please start thank you okay thank you Julian and uh, good afternoon everybody um I suppose the the reality is that like anything else in order to be successful neighborhood plan making requires commitment tenacity uh, and perhaps a little bit too much um, endurance Resources are really precious, and in order to save time and effort and to prevent frustration, it's very important to start off plan making on the right foot. Now, this can mean recognizing and, and avoiding some of the common problems. So, very quickly, I'm going to talk about focus, making a difference, working together, and bending the rules a little bit. So to start off with focus uh, making a difference. Now I've seen neighbourhood plans um, 100 pages long, or plans with 30, 40, or even more policies in them. Neighbourhood plans that, that try and cover just about every aspect of planning you can imagine. In my view, all neighbourhood plans must be aspirational. The whole point of producing a neighbourhood plan is to make a significant difference but taking on too much inevitably results in problems confusion conflicts and ultimately in, in wasted time and effort it's not just impossible for a neighborhood plan to cover everything um, it's also entirely unnecessary unfortunately quite a lot of neighborhood plans include policies that just repeat existing local or national planning policies but perhaps the bigger point is that trying to do too much just spreads the resource a little too thinly and this can result in policies that don't achieve their intention which lack evidence or which conflict with one another in a, 
in a long and a convoluted plan. And it leads to frustration, not least when the examiner strikes out years of work from the submitted plan. So the first point recognises that the time people put into neighbourhood plan making is incredibly precious. And it's therefore essential that a neighbourhood plan from the earliest stage drills down into those specific things that the community aspires to achieve and then that it then focuses on those things so in this way the neighborhood plan can meet its purpose and make a difference the next point relates to the, the powers of the, the qualifying body and also the benefits of working in partnership so neighborhood plans now been around for about eight years but i still pick up plans with policies saying development will or will not be permitted development will be refused shall be allowed shall not be granted whilst the neighborhood plan forms part of the development plan it's important to remember that the qualifying body doesn't suddenly become the decision making authority so the appropriate policy language in, in those respects, for example, would be development will or will not be supported. And in practice, once a, a plan's made or adopted, those words carry a significant weight. They, they do what they need to. And similarly, plan makers don't have the power to make up a completely new approach that ignores existing policies. I do often see policies like, for example, there will be no development in the countryside or in conservation areas or things like all development must provide a new cycleway. And these are things where planning support and knowledge become really important. Naval plan makers don't necessarily have the background that can come through through good support. Now, my experience is that as in, in many areas of planning, neighbourhood planning support can vary from the brilliant all the way through to the less than competent. Um, and this leads on to the, the importance of partnership working, especially with the local planning authority. I can say without any reservation that the very best neighbourhood plans in England are those where there's been positive collaborative working between the qualifying body and knowledgeable local authority neighbourhood planning officers. Perhaps because of the scope to get, I don't know, really involved with people and, and to tackle local issues in a hands-on way, neighbourhood planning officers do seem to include some of the best, most pragmatic and positive planners and bringing their experience to bear does have a massively beneficial impact on effective neighbourhood plan making. Now, the flip side to this is that the biggest neighbourhood planning disasters tend to have been where there's been a poor or even no relationship between plan makers and officers. Sadly, fully resourced good officer support isn't evenly spread across the country. Um, but if you are somewhere where it doesn't seem to exist, it's still worth remembering that the local authority has a statutory duty and funding to support neighbourhood planning, so it can hopefully still be nudged in the right direction. Okay, lastly, um, the two words that probably every neighbourhood planner should have tattooed across the foreheads, uh, basic conditions. The very worst thing naval plan makers can do is to ignore or to try to fight against the basic conditions and in particular existing policy that should be treated as something to work with or, or to work around. Planning is full of grey areas and naval planning is no different. The basic conditions they don't require strict adherence to policy. They state that naval plans should have regard to national policy and be in general conformity with local policy. This means that there's plenty of scope to bend the rules and no need at all to, no need at all to, to break them. 
The basic conditions don't require all policies to stick rigidly to or to effectively repeat existing local or national policies. I have come across plans that enable plans that are arguably just existing local and national policies with the name of the village thrown in every so often. And this is frustrating because lots of time and effort has gone into something that at the end of the day makes no difference at all. In contrast, some of the best neighbourhood planning policies push the boundaries and bend the rules. The resulting plans are different to anything else that exists and they relate directly to and they achieve something for the local community. I don't know, these are plans that might provide for things like specific kinds of development, promote innovative sustainability solutions, specify distinctive local design criteria, improve local biodiversity, all, all kinds of different things. The point is that, as it said in the, the MPPF, neighbourhood planning gives communities the power. And when done well, neighbourhood planning can be a genuinely powerful thing. Pushing the boundaries, what's working with existing policies and guidance provides plenty of scope for neighbourhood plans to meet the local community's aspirations. So in summary, four things. First, it's essential to focus. A plan with a few strong, well-worded policies is much better than one that's crammed full of weak policies. Two, don't lose sight of the whole purpose and point of a neighbourhood plan, which is to make a significant difference. Three, that can be best achieved through effective partnership working, especially with professional planning support from the local planning authority. And finally, if you can, look to bend but not break the rules. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. A lot of um, good uh, advice there in terms of, I think what we're talking about, the added value that um, neighbourhood plans can bring um, for local communities um, to take uh, advantage of in terms of the opportunity there. Um, next up is Eddie Taylor. Um, please unmute yourself, Eddie. Eddie is an independent planner and urban designer. He has extensive experience working with groups preparing neighbourhood plans. And he was one of the founding members of the Northwest Neighbourhood Planning Network. So if your mic is on, Eddie, please start. Thank you. Right, thanks, Julian. Um, so I'm going to list some reasons why it can be difficult for non-planners. And when I list these reasons, it does, of course, beg the question as to why these should be these reasons should stop some neighbourhood planners but not others but i'm going to list them anyway um so i think the first heading i'm going to look at is just understanding planning in general and neighbourhood planning in particular so a lot of people struggle to actually understand what actually a neighbourhood plan actually is i land use planning policies they think it can do all sorts of other things i've seen people wanting to do you know increased police numbers and things like that um so what it can and cannot do there's a lack of understanding of that um there's also a lack of understanding about what planning generally is uh, amongst a lot of people uh, so what what things come under planning and what things come under highways also what is a strategic against a non-strategic policy um because as nigel pointed out you've got to have general conformity with strategic policies. There's also a lot of jargon, and um, there's also a la lack of understanding of the type of evidence that is necessary for uh, supporting policies. Um, there's also some, there are also some concerns now about the role of neighbourhood planning, uh, neighbourhood plans post the, the, the latest white paper. Personally, I think they will still be around and can even be strengthened, but there is some doubts about that. We may talk about that more later on. Um, there's also, this, this lack of understanding isn't just amongst neighbourhood planners, it can also be amongst 
uh, local planners um, and it can also be amongst uh, councillors as well and there can be some opposition from local councillors. Some local councillors are very much against it and uh, for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are maybe legitimate, some are absolute complete nonsense uh, I've heard. Uh, the, in terms of actually helping people understand that there is of course guidance out there. So there is the roadmap that's actually I think is, is very good but I think there is a lot of room for import for a lot of room for improvements in other guidance, um, particularly on design. And um, uh, so I think you know I think there's definitely a lot of way that a lot of ways for, for for guidance to improve and help people understand planning better. Um, I think on design, there's a, for example, there's a lack of a lack of clarity on what a design code is, and I think this is going to be particularly important. With the with the new white paper, okay. Um, just a general lack of awareness um, is another thing that's that is another problem. When enabled planning groups are actually trying to engage with the local population, and they say we're working on an enabled plan, people just say they've never even heard of them. Uh, it, it, it does depend on where you live. Um, in some parts of the country, there's actually quite a lot of awareness of neighborhood planning and other, because and there's a lot of neighborhood plans, particularly in parished areas, particularly where there's a lot of pressure for development. So the neighborhood plans are often being developed in response to that. But in the northwest of England, around Merseyside and Greater Manchester, where I tend to work, there's a lot of people, far fewer people have actually heard about neighborhood planning and know what it is, which does present an issue when neighborhood plan, uh, neighborhood plan groups try and actually engage with the population just People just have never heard of them and I think there's a lack of promotion of them through the program uh, through the support program um, and I think in particular in urban areas as as, as has been pointed out by Gavin that the, the, where the, there's a lot of skewing and where naval planning has, has taken off in some places it hasn't and in, and in particularly in uh, in urban areas that haven't been taken off as much and that's partly because there's extra hurdles that forums have to go through but I think there's also a trick that's being missed, which you've actually, if you go back to the original 2010 uh, white paper on naval planning and localism, one of the things that naval plans were supposed to lead on to something other than just land use planning policies, they were supposed to be something that could be then used for regeneration. Now you're doing all this evidence work, all this engagement, uh, that you're getting people um, aware of, you know, talking about their area and what they want, you're agreeing vision and objectives, that's a perfect platform for doing something much more than just land use planning policies. And the land use planning policies should be working with these other forms of uh, projects and initiatives that could then come out of that. So I think that's something that is 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 really missing, I think, from, from the forums in particular, but maybe also for the parishes as well. Um, so the next issue I'd love to talk about is project management. This is quite difficult for a lot of groups, but again, particularly for the forums, if you've got a parish council, you've you've already got somebody, you've got ways of making decisions, and you've got some, you've probably got an office, or you've probably got a clerk, you can actually do a lot of stuff. The forums, they don't have that. Um, en engagement can be quite difficult. It's it's a, it's a set of skills, um, and usually I find actually enabled planning groups are actually very good at it. I think personally, I think they tend to be better at it than most local planning authorities when you actually compare them but i think it is an issue it is a difficult thing to do and it does require them to learn these skills if they don't already have them and it, you know it, it's time consuming like i said i think they can be very good at it i think they generally do relatively well compared to a lot of people in planning but it, it is uh it is a, an issue a stumbling block for a lot um and then i think the the level of support for the for enabled planning. Uh, local planning are, authorities are now required to support enabled planning groups, but they are, but this support it varies dramatically, partly because of attitude. Like I said, there are some councillors I know that are very much against enabled planning, um, even if planners generally are in favour of it or supportive of it, they certainly understand their obligations. But austerity also means that there's that it varies quite a lot in the amount of support they can give. And some local authorities have even been giving money to uh, to enable planning groups, but that's not going to happen in a lot of local authorities. Um, I think also the the support program, the technical support packages. I think there is 
having these delivered by just one large consultancy that could be looked at because I think there's maybe an opportunity to use independent consultancies more for this work and there's a potential advantages one would be competition and in some circumstances at least I think they'd be more likely to know about specific local stamp circumstances and be able to adapt and respond to the needs of, needs of groups rather than sort of fixed packages of support um, and I think there needs to be a in the light of the white paper especially and the fact that the support program is going to end this following not this financial year but the one next I think there needs to be an open discussion about what that support program should be and I think I, when I say an open support it, it should be anybody who's involved in neighborhood planning should be feeding into that discussion about how, the nature of the support program I think there's one last little thing I talk about about skewing um, I think also viability is a big big issue in some areas there is a lot of a lot of pressure for development and I think that um, actually helps concentrate people's minds it helps people focus because they've got something to actually deal with but in some parts of the country there is a lack of development there's a lack of viability and when you've just got some empty sites in your area and you think well wouldn't it be nice to have something here what do you do in terms of planning that is actually going to make that happen um, you could you know you can draw a line around an area and uh, allocate it for a use but that doesn't mean anybody's going to come forward and necessarily do it whereas in some parts of the country that's a lot more likely so yeah I think that's me done thanks very much Eddie plenty of food for thought there in terms of aspects of um, neighborhood planning um, I need to remind delegates that you've got the opportunity to ask questions we've had a number um, through um, but the, there's an opportunity as you know to ask questions so if we've got time we'll try and we'll try and cover them all um, our final speaker is is Tom Evans um, please unmute yourself Tom Tom is the neighborhood plan um, manager for uh, Cheshire East Council um, where he has helped over 50 parishes in the borough with their neighborhood plans um, Tom has been the architect of the authorities exemplar um, approach to uh, neighborhood planning support um, across that uh, local authority area so if your mic is on Tom please begin thank you it is thanks Julian and uh, thanks for the, the kind words I've never been an exemplar at anything in my life uh, right so I want to start off to say that um, the, the thing that I'm addressing today the topic that I'm talking about is uh, sustaining volunteer commitment over a period of time and as a as a way of introducing into that i think that one of the fundamental things that anybody out there who is not a planner and has to work with us needs to think about and remember is that planners are a little bit odd we're not we're not normal people in the the way that we think about the world it's not our fault we're we're, we're trained in a certain way and we're stuck with legislation that makes us look at the world through a certain lens and one of the things that I didn't realize this until a few years ago, but the way that we communicate as planners is really fundamental to making the process work for our communities and getting out of our heads this uh, way that we think about the world and helping people translate their ideas into that thinking mechanism is really, really important. And that mechanism is, is that we put things in little boxes. So we look at an issue. We break it down to its component parts and we reassemble the issue in a way that helps us understand the impacts related to each impact of those component parts. And that, I didn't realize that that's how I was thinking until I really struggled to communicate it. And I had to have a little think about, well, what's going on here? This is how we make decisions in, in planning. And this is what planning is, it's a specific thing. But I'm continually stuck with communicating that to people. So I had to step back and have a think about it. And I've been doing that for about five years with groups across the borough. As June said, we've got 50 or so groups in our authority. I've helped about 30 through the process, some with success, some more difficult. And um, I, I would look at this question. I thought there's two parts to it. Well, there's the, the commitment of the volunteers. That's a matter for the volunteers. But actually where we intersect with that is about the sustained period of time that that commitment is expected over. And my job is to reduce that period to being as short a time as possible. 
and I've got some thoughts on that, which I'll, uh, I'll talk through. I started off thinking about this through looking at the number of barriers and I prepared myself a long list of problems that neighborhood plan groups come up with. And it was too long to really relay here, but essentially it boiled down to two themes. And it was about the process and about people, you know, people are complicated and they bring a certain amount of chaos and not least myself. And the process itself is also difficult to navigate. So put those two things together. And it's amazing that any neighborhood plans get completed, to be honest. The remit of neighborhood planning is far too open-ended. It, it allows people to pick and choose whatever they want. And then you have to work through a process of why something should or should not be included. So the process is very difficult to understand what space neighborhood plans operate in. They must conform to the local plan, the national policy framework, but then they've got a free wide ranging remit to address local planning policy issues. And this is where it crosses over back to what Nigel was talking about, about duplication. And I see that a lot. And it's very hard to um, convince people that there's, it's not necessary for a neighborhood plan to, to rewrite local plan elements. Uh, understandably, people who enter a planning process in a local environment rediscover all the local issues which the local planning authority have done and they want to do something about it. And it's very natural and it's a, you know it's quite um, a reassuring process that they go through in that. So understanding the space of neighborhood plans accurately is really useful to narrowing down what the purpose of having a plan is for. And the people element is absolutely fundamental. I'll touch on this just briefly later on, but it's, it's understanding that people communicate differently and that planners roles in that that process is to translate and be a almost a, a language translator from what is uh, layman's interests and aspirations and put that into the right planning jargon and language that will get through an examination so there's a big translating role that we've got to play uh, so one of the key things that i think is important to this is getting it done quick so start with a clear purpose spend time thinking about why you want a neighborhood plan and get buy-in from the other people to that purpose. Something that you can return to and check if you are still trying to achieve the same thing. If your purpose is to uh, secure community infrastructure levy, uh, additional funds through that, then that's great. If it's to allocate new land for development, that's fantastic. If it's to write, write a design code, that's great. If it is to frustrate a local plan process, if it is in response to a local planning application, you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons. That might be useful to open up a discussion of why you want to do something more positive. But if you start off on an adversarial footing to try and prevent something with a neighborhood plan, it does tend to end up in a lot of complications and frankly disappointment, which is very difficult for groups to, to get to grips with. So one of the things that we've tried to support in our authority through my role is getting it done quickly and i read something a while back and it it stuck with me about how planning how policy in general is a um protracted process when actually it should be a thick experience uh, the term thick experience stuck with me i'm not sure if i like it or not but anyway it stuck with me so i sat down and had to think about how we could do this in a day and i got lots of post-it notes out and i tried it with a few groups and it, and it worked to a large degree everyone that i've worked with in the rooms that have been sometimes two people in a parish hall or sometimes 30 people in a town hall has got an idea of what they want to plan for they have a plan in their head and my job is to try and help them get it out of their head and onto paper and not to worry too much about the the um the, the basic con sorry Nigel but the basic conditions to start with that's the complicated stuff that comes down the line it's getting the plan out of the head identifying what is planning what is not and writing it down getting it started I spend so long talking to groups about the same thing over and over again and the key thing is to write something down and organize those thoughts and create a basic structure of a plan to work with um, so that's the first thing the second thing about maintaining commitment is that um, beware of echo chambers oh, people in um, communities out there can go round and round in conversations and not be tested in an appropriate way about what they're proposing in their plans so Sometimes without a, a meaningful um, test of accountability, it's possible for neighbor plans to have this circular process and come up against the same barriers over and over again. And I have this uh, on with a few uh, groups, but it, it's a difficult process to go through. So if you build in some sort of meaningful accountability to your, your project plan, maybe it's a report back to the qualifying body at the right stages to check what's going on. Maybe it's a, 
a public meeting with a, a representative of the local authority, but something to check your own thinking outside of your own group. This can be really, really useful. And the third thing is, um, it's, a, it's kind of a small informal thing, but also a big one at the end of it, it's rewards. So staying committed, you need some reason to stay committed. You need a reward through it. So if you are working in a group out there, give yourselves some recognition that you've done a good job when you've got through part of the process. Mark the milestones, it might be a small thing. You know, we're a bit constrained now about going to the pub perhaps, but you know, do something, have a drink with, with colleagues, have a meal, do something, a, a kind word to recognize someone's hard work. That makes a massive difference about keeping people going. But towards the end of the process, and this is where you need to look at other examples, monitor the impact of the neighborhood plan. We have groups in our authority that have accessed hundreds of thousands of pounds of sill money that they would never have had without the plan. We have one group that started out purposely to secure silt and it's not a bad reason to do an April plan and in the future they've, they've got in the order of a million or so pounds coming through because we have a large allocation in that area. And monitoring that success and what it enables a parish or town council to do is really really important to keeping going when things get stuck. And the last thing about this is the, uh, the, the sprinkle of magic that you can get. And that is because in every decent plan I've come across, there's been a community champion there, someone who has individually dragged people kicking and screaming across the line and got things done. And sometimes it's fallen on them individually and sometimes they've motivated around them. But the power of one individual to drive this is really evident when it gets a bit boring, a bit tiresome, a bit long in the tooth in the process. And that um, complemented by a, a good consultant can really work wonders. Um, consultants are a really important part of it. Authorities can't and frankly shouldn't be involved in the detail of your plan making. They are plans for communities written by communities and as much as authorities want to help it's really important that the plans do represent community voice and not the local authority. So that dividing line is important that's where your consultant comes in. And underestimating the sort of the personal dynamics around that could cost you dearly. If you get a good consultant who you can listen to and uh, take advice from, that is, is worth its weight in gold and will save you endless, endless meetings and time. So to sum up, planners are slightly odd. Understanding that will help you. But ultimately, what planners' job is, is to be creative in how we communicate. So we've got to recognise our own oddness and help you understand what is going on in our minds because we're relating that back to hard legislation and examiners that will hold you to that. So we've got to build trust through that and communicate openly. And it's not until you've got that trust and you've got the recognition that we're talking at odds sometimes that the advice can be truly heard. I've given a lot of advice which is consistent across different groups. Sometimes it is listened to and heard, sometimes it's not. And when it's not heard, it's not a case of saying, you know, just listen to me, listen to me. It's a case of going back and thinking, well, how do I get that message across to be uh, heard and taken up? And sometimes that's probably the, the most difficult thing about um, reducing the amount of time you've got to spend and sustaining the commitment is listening to good advice when it's there, but also finding the right person to give you it. Thanks very much, uh, Tom. Uh, I was particularly taken with the um, importance of um, volunteers being well led. Um, and I know that some volunteers find that um, there's just a few of them um, dragging the process along, or as you said, maybe even just one person that's able to, uh, to do that. Clearly, it's a problem if that person subsequently is no longer able to. Um, take the lead. Um, okay, um, now um, we've got an opportunity to um, to answer um, at least some of your questions. We've got about 20 minutes left uh, on the webinar. Um, and first of all, I'd like to put a um, question um, to Nigel. Uh, hopefully all the speakers have got their uh, microphones on now. Um, and um, Tom touched upon this aspect, but through your work, you will have seen a lot of plans come through uh, through the system. Um, to what extent is access to independent professional planning expertise a factor uh, in neighbourhood plans making and neighbourhood plan teams making good progress? 
and submitting effective plans. Can you see spot the difference, as it were? In a word, yes. Um, it's okay. It's really important to get good advice. The better the advice, the better the plan. It's it, it's just the truism. Um, it's dead easy for me to say that though. Uh, there's a cost involved, and unlike I don't know, um, find a plumber or rate a plumber.com, there isn't a, a rate a planner, and, and certainly not a rate a neighborhood planner.com that I'm aware of. So, how do you know who you're getting actually knows what they're talking about? And I think there are definitely more and more good professional planners who can support neighborhood planning. But I have honestly found over eight years that. There are people who, who kind of haven't given very good advice at all and, and communities have been taken in by them. There should be something that isn't at the time aware of at the moment. There should be something that separates out the wheat from the chaff. Um, good advice makes all the difference. If you've got a limited budget and there's limited resource, which is nearly always the case, then the most important times to get people involved, to get professional advice involved, is right at the beginning, so that you can focus on the things that, that are important. And then right at the end as well, before submitting the plan, get it sense checked, do a mock examination. Um, <laughs> getting that done by, by somebody who knows what we're talking about, it, it can make all of the difference and they'll, they'll get rid of the policies that don't work. They'll explain how policies can be improved to achieve what's needed. Uh, and the, re the result is a, a plan where there's not disappointment. You know, but naval plan examiners don't set, start off with the aim of putting red lines through plans. We, you know, we all work to create naval plans. Um, when we're examining them, the aim is to get them through in as best shape as possible. And we know that it's really disappointing when you spend the best part of a couple of years bringing forward something that all you want to do is make a positive change, make a difference. When an examiner's report comes back and they've deleted half your policies and changed the rest of them. Um, but good advice can prevent that from happening. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Nigel. Um, I'm going to switch now to, to you, Gavin, and put a, uh, a question about what the government might be thinking of doing next in terms of funding. This is in relation to um, neighbourhood forums that are often uh, in deprived parts of uh, of the country in non-parished areas um, and some forums have um, fallen by the wayside due to the uh, withdrawal of funding. Um, it's been now been reintroduced for forums to, to an extent. Um, do you think the government are going to provide more support for um, forums, particularly those that have um, ceased to operate and maybe could be uh, resurrected with the right uh, financial support. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a really um, pertinent question. I mean, what what we know over the past uh, well ten months or so um, or less post the last election is the government have discovered what they've termed a leveling up agenda. And when we wrote the recommendations or the areas for action in our work, we decided to pin all of our comments and all of our recommendations against the key policy objectives of government. So leveling up agenda was one of them, wider empowerment agenda under you know labels of localism and so on also housing supply questions so everything we've done we've we've been back to that and indeed this whole issue about um looking at the funding and support arrangements across the piece but also specifically what kind of funding and support arrangements you would want um surrounding neighborhood planning in the light of a leveling up agenda um that has been uh, I think received pretty positively, and as I say, the the eighteen thousand um, pound amount that was announced um, a month or so ago. Time flies, doesn't it? Maybe a bit longer than that now. Um, that that was a direct result of of the work we'd done um, in terms of 
groups that had um, stalled or dropped out. I think I think there was some constant that there has been for some considerable time. I think an understanding of across anybody, whatever sector, whatever role they play in neighbourhood planning, um, that urban areas and forum areas and de deprived communities had been, you know, really starkly underrepresented in the neighbourhood planning endeavour. And um, you know, I think the civil service do understand that. So it's difficult for me to tell you for sure, but I can tell you that um, any group that has stalled or abandoned and wants to come back into neighborhood planning for those kinds of reasons, that they're in an, an area where they have, shall we say, a greater set of barriers, um, I'm pretty sure that MHCLG slash locality will be looking at them very favorably. Um, I think that's probably where I should, where I should, you know, stop. But we did actually look specifically. We we targeted and looked at why groups had stalled or had abandoned. So that formed part of the research itself, and that that led to some of the recommendations that we've um, that we've put in there. And it's interesting when Eddie brought up the point about um, non land use planning um, matters um, in neighbourhood planning. Um, that features in our report as well because I think a lot of a lot of neighbourhoods find a lot of um, energy from um, identifying and wanting something to happen against a whole range of different issues that that, that impinge or, or shape their neighbourhood, not only the narrower land use planning one. So some of my comments are about where we might be, you know, moving and heading in the future, as well as how to make you know the existing if you like structure of neighborhood planning um work better uh, more fairly and um and, and reach the parts that neighborhood planning has struggled to reach i suppose oh thanks very much for that gavin there's some tantalizing glimpses there of what the um, uh, research is going to uh, reveal um i've now got a question for eddie um this is in relation to the definition of neighbourhood areas in parish parts of the of the country. Um, as you know, the default position is for the whole parish um, to be the neighbourhood area. Um, but in some circumstances, um, the um, the neighbourhood plan perhaps ought to include adjoining land, which is part of the same settlement. And I wonder whether you've come across examples of where. Um, the neighbourhood area has not been fully defined to include the areas that should be encompassed within within a single plan. Yeah, well, there's an example was in Merseyside, um, which is just out just outside of Liverpool in Sefton. You've got two councils, or parish council Melling and a town council McGull, and the Melling conurbation kind of just dips its toe into Magull, and the Magull conurbation dips its toe into Melling. So what they actually did, um, they both effectively took a piece of each other. They kind of did a deal where Magull took a little bit of Melling, and Melling took a little bit of Magull, and it, that seems to have worked. Uh, at least as far as Magull are concerned, Melling have stalled on their plan at the moment, but Magull finished theirs. Um, I've been involved with others where there's been a little bit of um, where it's not been quite so amicable and uh, where a, a, a town council, effectively a town spilt over into a neighbouring parish and wanted to, you know, the, the conurbation did and um, the, they, they kind of wanted to have that control over that area and the parish council didn't want to give it to them and it didn't quite um, work out that way. And I think in that case, the the parish council still hasn't actually completed its neighbourhood plan. So whether that's a, a massive problem with the conurbation in the in the town council area, I don't know. But um, it was there'd been a bit of history between those two councils pre neighbourhood planning, and it spills over into it, unfortunately. Okay, thank you uh, for that, Eddie. Um, 
we've had a, a question um, in relation to um, the resources that uh, local planning authorities have to um, to support neighbourhood planning. Um, it's a question of uh, whether um, the RTPI is aware um, of what which councils have neighbourhood planning teams or a dedicated um, neighbourhood plan officer. Um, I can say that the work we've done in the northwest of England um, involving um, planning aid volunteers, we have been monitoring the progress of all these plans and what resources are being put into it in terms of local authority um, support. Um, I have to say very few local authorities that we're aware um, have um, offices that only deal uh, with neighbourhood planning. Um, um, most authorities appear to have um, Offices who are um, designated to deal with either all neighbourhood plans or some neighbourhood plans, um, planning officers, but it's part of a bigger day job that they've got, and clearly that's that's an issue um, mm. for um, often local uh, plan teams to pick this up that are very often in small um, shire district areas, in particular, only a handful, two, three, four people at most. So clearly there is an issue there in terms of some councils being able to have the resource available um, to assist um, neighbourhood plan groups. Um, not surprisingly, we've had a number of questions related to um, the proposed planning reforms. Um, and I want to open this up to um, all the uh, speakers to see what thoughts you have about which elements of neighbourhood planning do the speakers think should definitely be carried forward in the planning reforms and which should be forgotten about. Um, as I recall, there wasn't a great deal said about neighbourhood planning in the, the white paper that was published, just a couple of pages. Um, so it's difficult to know where the mm. government might be, might be going on this, but I'm going to start with Tom um in terms of what do you think um would be um key things that ought to happen in terms of the government's approach to neighborhood planning i think i'm opening up to the to the other speakers tom please first thanks julian um i think that the the white paper's focus on design and high quality design is a really important area that neighbor plans could be used really valuably for so i'd like to see a requirement an actual requirement to address design issues in a local area every area has its own unique design style as bland as it may be in some parts of it as fascinating as it as it might be in others and it'd be one of the the areas that i think a lot of our groups that i speak to they all want to do something on design they're never quite sure exactly what until we talk about design codes and then get external consultants to come and help them. So I think that's a real uh, area which could be very useful to them. Uh, land allocations above those in the, the local plan I feel should always be available to those communities that have got the appetite for it. And I think in terms of the process and how local authorities deal with it, I'd be interested to see what happens to referendums. There are so few that fail referendum. We do have one in Cheshire East, actually. I think there's three, and one of them is in Cheshire East. But there's mm -hmm. so few that fail referendum. You've got to question the, the, the worthy, the worthwhileness of that process, especially when the government funding that comes to local authorities primarily spent on funding that. That's the most expensive part of the system for us to administer. So I wonder if there's a, a, an appetite for government to look at different ways of uh, formal consultation demonstrating engagement with the community and it's as it's represented at a representative level and perhaps looking at whether the referendum remains necessary thanks very much uh, tom i'll i'll move on to uh, nigel please for your thoughts on on what the future might hold for neighborhood planning please unmute yourself thank you I'm not a, a massive fan of the um, white paper. I think anything that sets out aspirations without the funding behind them is a bit of a waste of space. But specific to neighbourhood planning, um, the white paper refers to, you know, should, should neighbourhood planning continue, which for me kind of reflects 
an absence of understanding. The, the, the truth is that there are now literally tens of thousands of neighbourhood planners. Cumulatively, millions of hours have been spent by volunteers with the single purpose of producing plans that improve places. That's a tremendous resource. It's huge. And yet we've got a white paper that says, should neighbourhood planning go ahead? You know, should it continue? Um, there's mm. plenty of people who thoroughly understand neighbourhood planning out there. They need to get involved or the, the white, the authors of the white paper need to involve people who actually understand it and know what they're talking about. That would be a good starting point. Um, in doing that, then the focus should be how can neighbourhood planning be improved? It's got loads of problems. We've talked about some of them today. Um, but by focusing on those in, those problems and, and sorting them out, then we'll get naval planning to be even more effective and, and to do the things that it really can. But at the minute, there's a huge wasted resource. There's lots of knowledge. There's lots of people involved, and that really needs to be captured. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, let's move on to Eddie um, in terms of your thoughts for the future of neighbourhood planning. Has the government um, appropriately uh, uh, set out the options in, in the white paper, do you think? Um, I think, I don't think so. I mean, it does, as it's, it does ask about whether you think neighbourhood planning should continue and it does have a proposal that it should, it should be retained as an important means of community input. And, um, they say also they'll support communities to make better use of digital tools. But I think what it doesn't really mention, um, which I think what I agree with what Nigel said, it's like the, the, there's a huge amount of resources. I mean, if you actually look at the amount of hours that people put in, volunteer hours as well as consultants and local planning authorities, but even just the, the actual additional resources it brings into planning by bringing in volunteers, it's absolutely huge. And if you were to actually put a price on it, it'd be millions of pounds of extra resources are brought in voluntarily because people actually care about their areas. And to just, to not really even mention that in the white paper, when you're talking about should naval planning be continued or not, I think it's a massive, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive sort of gap really. And another big gap is that one of the things that, uh, that a lot of neighborhood plans have actually led to greater amounts of development than would otherwise have been proposed through the local plans. This is very often happens, and I think overall, they've actually led to more development than would otherwise have been. Maybe, maybe Gavin can, can give more information on that, but that's my understanding. Certainly in some places it has done. And if, if the government is, and the main thrust of this white paper seems to be about trying to get more development. Now, if that's what they want, then, then they should be supporting neighborhood planning, and they should be saying that in the white paper. There should be a word of that. And I think also about speed, if you look at the light amount of time it takes to do an able plan, yes, some can drag on for years, you know, five years or something like that, but that's long for an able plan. You compare that with the local plans, I mean, they're lucky if they're done in seven um, and they can really drag on. So I actually think neighbor plans can actually be quicker at being developed. They can actually lead to more development and they can actually bring in resources. And a couple, the other thing that, that the, the white paper talks an awful lot about is engagement but it talks about engagement in terms of digital engagement. And the reality is the best engagement, a lot of good engagement, while there's room for digital engagement, it's important. A lot of really meaningful engagement is offline, just walking around an area to do a character assessment, you know, is really important. So actually, you can't, you know, you, you can't really replace that offline. And that isn't, and, and, and that's not mentioned in the white paper. And I think enabled plan, planners have done an awful, have done quite well on that. You know, they've really done, They've really done well on, um, you know, it's patchy, some are better than others, but there's an awful lot of people who've been engaged in the planning process through neighbor planning and, and to to not mention that, I think, is, 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 is a, again, a miss. And the last thing I'd say is about, is about design specifically. The, the white paper goes on a lot about beauty and it doesn't really say what that means. And while I understand that an area, it's nice that an area might be beautiful, but there's lots of other things that you might want an area to be. You might want an area to be I know interesting or fun or welcoming or cool or exciting or solemn or peaceful or pleasant or restful there's a million vibrant there's a lot of things you could be instead of beautiful and they're just as good 
and it really narrows that down so it kind of tries to open things up in terms of design but then it narrows it down to being aesthetics and design is not just about what character of the area you want it's all about how people move around about natural surveillance um and a million and one things so i think um but i think and, it, and in terms of linking that with naval planning it doesn't really make the link with it, it the main the main the only time it touches on that is it really as far as i can see is when it talks about um beauty can have something to do with char local character and local input into that and i think it it's really when i've dealt with 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 design with naval planning groups they are interested in obviously the appearance of an area but they're also interested in in, in as far as design is concerned in how people move around and natural surveillance and uh you know and lots of other design issues other than just aesthetics Thank, thanks very much, Eddie. I'm going. We're, we're running out of time, folks. Uh, I'm going to put um, give Gavin a chance to, if you like, um, provide a roundup of um, what his understanding is of uh, government thoughts going forward. Um, and just on the back of that, we've got an interesting question about um, the community right to reparish urban areas. Um, one of the concerns that I've got is that forums are only designated for five years and then they have to um, re become redesignated to continue and in fact in the northwest of England some uh, forums have not got to the end of producing a neighborhood plan before they need to redesignate so um, this clearly is an opportunity maybe for urban parishes is that a way forward Gavin? <clears throat> Oh, I didn't see that one coming. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think uh, I'm trying to remember now. There was only, was it Park Royal? I'm trying to remember now. There's only one um, urban uh, neighbourhood since that um, legal entitlement was introduced um, mm. that has pursued that route. And um, you've caught me on the hop a bit because, I mean, I know there are a lot of different hurdles. And I think what's happened, of course, is that an area that wanted to pursue neighborhood planning realized that they would get themselves bogged down in, in, a, in a long legal process of trying to get parished and wouldn't make any progress on the neighborhood plan. So I think the two things are best kept a bit separate. But I do think that um, our findings are that forums um, definitely provide a platform for community voices that was otherwise potentially lacking in, in, in some urban areas. And, and I think there does need to be some attention paid to, um, you know, the status of the community voice within neighborhoods that don't have parishes, whether or not it's formally, you know, going down the route of becoming a, a legally constituted parish or not. I think that's a slightly you know, bigger question. But if, if you wanted me to continue on the white paper theme, um it's it's interesting i'm not going to try and attempt to do a big kind of broad takedown of the white paper um as tempting as it may be um but i mean it is interesting the question or well, there are two questions on neighborhood planning that are posed in the white paper the question actually um appears on my reading to be pro neighborhood planning because it is actually inviting people to say well why shouldn't we have it the, the wording of the question specifically is, do we agree that neighborhood plans should be retained? Very different from saying, do you agree that neighborhood plans should not be retained? So um, I think there is an appetite for neighborhood planning in some form to continue post this set of reforms. However, my understanding is that the people that um, held the pen on the draft of the white paper didn't really know anything about neighborhood planning and kind of forgot it. And it does show up really when you scan the whole document. Um, so I suppose my take is there's lots of scope for people to engage with MHCLG. They're, they're, they've got their ears open um, because they realize that they do need to um, fill that gap, that, that kind of that thinking gap a little bit. Obviously, some of the work that we've been doing um, will help them in some regard, but I think there's scope for others who are active on the ground to also bring bring in their their views. Um, 
one of the things you should bear in mind and this is to kind of take it out is is neighborhood planning will have to fit into whatever system um emerges after this set of reforms some people are thinking that they could be really truly radical other people are, are thinking that actually government are likely to row back quite quite um a lot from from the way the white paper currently reads we won't know that for a while um so i would kind of go back to first principles and say what actually can neighborhood planning this is now i'm, I'm, I'm putting the stress on neighborhood planning rather than neighborhood plans per se what value added can neighborhood planning provide into producing sustainable outcomes high quality places whether we call them beautiful or not i agree with eddie it's a bit of a bizarre archaic almost term to drop in um, in 21st century planning um and i think that um we have to recognize that the influences on the white paper come from countries that have zoning and codified systems that's building codes and so on um and of course what the white paper talks about is front loading participation now that's quite different from um the model we have for neighborhood planning at the moment and one concern i have is that neighborhood planners and neighborhood planning um efforts could be just funneled into providing detail um, after all the big decisions have been taken um, whereas i think there's a wider issue here about not just neighborhood plans but as i say planning by neighborhoods with neighborhoods and how that needs to be supported and engendered in what looks like a, a renewed attention to front loading of participation helping to set agendas getting involved in visioning and um, you know, shaping what actually an overall plan wants to achieve long term. Thank, thanks very much Gavin. We're going to have to uh, to finish uh, at that point. Um, obviously we've gone a bit over time. I can appreciate, I uh, can see there are a few some more questions that have not uh, we've not been able to get around to. Um, we'll try and find a way if we can um, to get some answers uh, back to back to delegates. Um, so I hope you found uh, the, the the webinar useful. Um, there was an opportunity for you to provide some feedback uh, when it finishes. Um, also a bit of a plug for um, planning aid. If you're interested in becoming a planning aid volunteer, then please go to the RTPR website click on need planning advice in the top right hand corner and then click on volunteers there's a form to fill in there so um, all that's left me for me to say is thank you very much for all of you who have joined today and many thanks to our speakers thank you <laughs>